Every industry has its rules and regulations, which are needed for stability and safety. But when ICANN changes the rules that you've been accustomed to or discusses new rules that affect your domain name investments, what can you do about it? Stay tuned to find out. Three messages before today's interview educates and motivates you. First, if you're a domain name investor, don't you have unique legal needs that require domain name technical know-how and industry experience? That's why you need David Westlow of Wiley Ryan. Go search for David Westlow on Domain Sherpa, watch his interview, and you can see for yourself that he can clearly explain issues, can help you with buy-sell agreements, deal with website content issues and UDRP actions, and even help you write your website terms and conditions. David Westlow is the lawyer to call for internet legal issues. See for yourself at newmediaip.com. Second, Managing multiple domain name marketplace and auction site accounts is a pain. Inevitably, you forget to sign into one and you lose a great domain, or worse. Now imagine using a single, simple to use, and comprehensive control panel to manage all of your accounts. That's Protrata. You can set up search filters, analyze domains, automate bidding, list domain names for sale, buy domains across all major marketplaces. Protrata also has a new semantic engine that builds Google-friendly websites with rich content and network feeds. Sign up at Protrata.com to get 20 free credits and start building and monetizing your domains today. Finally, if you have questions about domain names, where should you go to ask them? The answer is DNForum.com. Not only is DNForum the largest domain name forum in the world, it's the best. You can learn about domain names and the industry buy and sell domain names, talk about the domain name news that's happening in the industry, and even meet domainers just like yourself. Register for a free DN Forum account and begin advancing your skills and knowledge today. And when you do sign up, send me a friend request so we can connect on DN Forum. Here's your program. Hey everyone, I'm Michael Seiger and I'm the publisher of DomainSherpa.com, the website where you come to learn how to become a successful domain name investor or online entrepreneur directly from the experts. You've spent your time and hard-earned money building a portfolio of domain names. You've followed all the rules and you consider yourself one of the good guys in the domain name industry. But with ICANN's ever-changing industry messages, VeriSign's monopoly on the .com TLD, and the news of yet another reverse domain name hijacking in the news, it's sometimes difficult to feel in control of your domain name investing destiny. Today's guest is on the domain industry's front lines and serves as a voice of advocacy for domain name investors and the industry. We're joined by Phil Corwin, founding principal at Virtual Law LLC and counsel to the Internet Commerce Association. Phil, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for inviting me, Michael. It's great to be here. Internet Commerce Association, or ICA, what's the main purpose of the association? Well, it's very simple, Michael. The main purpose of the association is to give domain investors, that is, domainers, uh, eyes, ears, and most importantly, a voice, both in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, and with the uh, executive agencies, like Department of Commerce, which made a very big decision this morning and uh, also within ICANN, uh, which uh, also makes many, many decisions that impact uh, what domain investors can do and what their costs are and what their rights are, which is the most important thing. Right. And I want to get into that Department of Commerce decision that was made this morning. I'm going to come back to that because that was important. Um, But I I think this is an important point of ICA and one that I wasn't uh, aware of before either that you are the eyes and the ears for the domain name investing community. I don't, I've never attended an ICANN meeting. And when I get my daily briefings from ICANN through, you know, I think it's my ICANN.org, um, you know, that's a lot of information to deal with. So that is the purpose of It is of like drinking out of a fire hose sometimes. <laughs> it yes, is. To, and, well, and, and it's not just a fire hose because, you know, I may get my portion today, but I really need to understand what happened for the previous year that led up to the letter that came in that the CEO of ICANN responded to or what have you. There's there's a lot to process. Well, there is, and uh, frankly, ICANN is not an easy an organization to understand uh, uh, how it operates, what all the different constituencies and working groups and support organizations 
do, who the different personalities are, where they're coming from, uh, and you need to spend a lot of time uh, engaged with ICANN uh, to know how to get the background information you need to respond intelligently when different things are on the line. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so tell me this, Phil. If ICA didn't exist, what might have happened in the industry by now? Uh, Congress might have passed the Snow Bill years ago. That would have uh, set up a separate uh, trademark regime just for domain names. That was even more unfair than the current trademark regime. Uh, we certainly can't take uh, credit for killing uh, SOPA. A lot of people had a hand in that early this year. But we were the only group to communicate to Congress about the trademark aspects of SOPA and how they might negatively impact the domain industry going forward if that bill had been enacted. Uh, right now, as ICANN is continuing to fill in the details on the new rights protection mechanisms uh, for new TLDs, we're still engaged every day of the week in making sure that uh, the final rules respect the due process rights of uh, domain registrants and uh, are balanced. That is, that domain rights are given equal credence with trademark rights and just aren't subservient to uh, trademark. So uh, it's it's a continuing uh, effort and if we were engaged uh, certainly there'd be no voice for the entire industry uh, speaking out on key issues. Yeah. Uh, that, now, that will uh, determine whether you can keep a domain or lose it. Uh, you know right now with this new uniform rapid suspension for new TLDs the whole fight has been about keeping that as a very narrow focused supplement to the UDRP which needs to be reformed on its own and we keep pushing to get that going or whether it's going to be a $300 replacement for the UDRP where trademark owners win about all the time because the rules are stacked in their favor and uh, uh, I can't think of anything more important to a domain investor than the ability to keep your assets away from others who uh, uh, as the saying goes a lot more has been stolen uh, over the course of time with a fountain pen than with a gun. So uh, we want to make sure the uh, the agreements uh, don't let anybody steal things they shouldn't be stealing. Makes sense. So it's not just the, you know, it, I think there's sort of the, uh, the feeling in the domain name industry that there are the haves and the have-nots. There are the people who have the domain portfolios of 10,000, 50,000, 150,000 out there you know, the people with the haves that ser have a, a serious amount of uh, capital invested in domain names. And so it's to their advantage to make sure that there is a person and an association like yourself representing them uh, in all of these locations in Washington. Whereas there's another group of people that, so let's call them the have-nots, that have maybe a thousand or two thousand domain names. And maybe they're not great domain names, a single word generic that uh, some company is trying to take as their property because they have a trademark in, you know, one standard industrial class. Is the ICA serving both parties, the people with large portfolios and the people with small portfolios? Oh, oh absolutely. I believe we are. Uh, uh, you, you know, we're, we're like every trade association. A trade association is basically a group of uh, entities that compete in the marketplace, in the economic marketplace but that cooperate in the policy marketplace because they have common interest to defend. Uh, we have some of the biggest uh, companies and individuals in the domain space, and we have members and supporters of a much lower scale in that 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 domain portfolio range. Uh, and uh, we don't find any significant difference on the policy issues between the biggest and the smallest among our membership, the, the uh, keeping the right, uh, protecting the rights of registrants, uh, it's the same issue whether you have 5,000 domains or 500,000. Uh, just your risk exposure is greater if you have 500,000. So uh, we welcome members uh, at every level of investment and interest, and uh, uh, we don't uh, lean one way or the other because we haven't had to. We find that. Uh, keeping the rules fair and balanced are uh, is the same issue for everybody regardless of their success in the economic marketplace. Yep. All right. And so when I introduced you at the beginning of the interview, Phil, I said your role with ICA was counsel. What does that mean? Are you 
the in, the entire legal team associated with ICA? Well, uh, we we have other lawyers who are members who uh, chime in on uh, legal issues and make contributions when we take when we publish a comment letter to ICANN or to uh, the U.S. government. Uh, uh, it's been vetted by our members. They, they, uh, this letter we sent uh, recently on dot com pricing, uh, urging uh, a reduction in the base price and uh, a freeze on the price going forward. And we just got half a loaf this morning from Department of Commerce. Uh, that was vetted with our members. Our members made excellent suggestions for improving the letter. So uh, when we post a document, it's a consensus document that reflects the uh, consensus position among our members. Makes sense. All right, so let's talk about that Department of Commerce decision that was announced this morning. What was uh, announced? Well, what was announced was that the Department of Commerce uh, approved uh, VeriSign being the registry operator for .com for another six years. The new contract starts on December 1st of this year, ends November 30th of 2018. But they made a very big change from the current contract and from the contract that ICANN's board had approved in June during the ICANN meeting held in Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, the current contract and the one that ICANN had approved would have allowed VeriSign to uh, increase prices of dot-com uh, registrations or renewals without having to show any justification at all by 7% and 4 out of the next six years. Uh, and that would have increased dot com prices and and you know VeriSign they did it four times under this contract mm -hmm. they would have been derelict in their duty their shareholders not to do it in four times in the next contract it would have raised dot com prices uh, from the current these are wholesale prices from the current seven eighty five right now to ten dollars and thirty cents before this new contract expired uh, and then, of course, the registrars add their own wholesale, uh, their own retail markup and other f uh, the ICANN fee on top of that. It's right. at least another $3 on top. Department of Commerce said you can keep the contract, you can keep the $785 base price, which uh, we had urged a reduction to $585 because that's the price for .NET uh, domains. And VeriSign's doing the same job out of the exact same facilities same work. Yeah. with the same employees. For .NET as they are for .com, there's no difference, uh, and I'll get more into uh, why they don't need the cash in a moment. Uh, but they said going forward, no more price increases without justification. The price is frozen at 7.85 for the next six years, unless you VeriSign can either show that there is new ICANN consensus policies that have been adopted that you're subject to, like every other registry operator, that add to your costs right. of running the registry. And that's fair. We have no objection to that. Or if something's happened in the realm of cybersecurity that have increased your costs of running a secure registry, which is very important for dot-com registrants, and we have no objection to that, uh, we we cert we would have allowed in our suggestions for the exactly the same type of uh, increases. But bar barring that, uh, Department of Commerce is not even going to allow for cost of living increases, which we had suggested uh, would be reasonable if they had been accompanied by the reduction in the base price. So uh, it's a decision that's going to collectively save uh, domain registrants. Uh, our our good member Mike Birkins over at the domains. Uh, he just did the calculations about an hour ago about what it saves a uh, domain investor per thousand dot com domains over the next six years. It's quite a bit of money. Uh, Do you know so, what that number is uh, offhand? Roughly? No, I'd have to uh, get out of Skype right now and, and no uh, worries. bring up a web browser. I'll make but sure that if uh, and, I'm, dot com and uh, you know, and we pointed out in our letter uh, this letter took a lot of research. I forget how many footnotes are in it, but I, I think there were close to 20. I spent a lot of time going over VeriSign's press releases and uh, financial statements while writing this letter. I don't think most people are aware that uh, in the last two years, VeriSign distributed almost $1 billion to its shareholders in special dividends. Wow. Uh, uh, I don't think most people are aware that they still have 1.4 billion cash on hand and announced that they plan to spend more than half of that on stock buybacks to increase the stock price. 
So not the picture of a company that needs a lot of price increases to invest in its business. It looks like a company that has more cash than it knows what to do with, and that probably weighed in as a significant factor with the Department of Justice and Department of Commerce uh, uh, when they... Uh, uh, revised the contract from what I can had, had approved. Yeah, no, I didn't realize that. Great research, and, and uh, you know, I know I'm appreciative of somebody bringing that up to the uh, Department of Commerce and making them aware of it. That you know, it's not necessary to raise prices. Um, so I mentioned the introduction. And, that and, you're and there, let me say, there are some issues raised by the approval table. Well, it's good news. Uh, there are some other issues. Uh, uh, and we're going to be filing another letter with Commerce uh, raising some of those issues. But uh, it, it was a very new domain investors this yeah. morning. Yeah. I mentioned in the introduction that you're the founding principal at Virtual Law LLC. Is that a law firm that uh, that you founded? And what do you specialize in? Well, uh, that that is a law firm uh, located in Washington, D.C. It specializes in uh, advocacy, uh, particularly with the federal government, basically lobbying. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm also, uh, so I do my government relations work out of uh, virtual law. Sometimes I team up with other individuals or firms uh, on an as-needed basis for clients. And I'm also of counsel at a uh, intellectual property law firm in Washington so that when my clients need uh, to do a trademark registration, a patent registration, to bring litigation against somebody I uh, work with the law firm uh, on those kind of hardcore legal issues because, that frankly, my expertise is on public policy and how to influence it successfully, and their expertise is on uh, you know patent and trademark office work and uh, litigation. So uh, it's a good combination, and we can uh, offer clients uh, whatever they need in those areas. Yeah, and so you know that was sort of my feeling as I was uh, doing some background research on ICA that it seems like it's an associate a trade association group, but but really that is uh, the the organizational body for a lobbyist group whose purpose is to speak for the domain name investment investing community. Would you say that that's a fair characterization? Yes, yeah, it is a trade association. It's a uh, a five hundred one c three nonprofit uh, trade association under the tax laws, uh, registered as a District of Columbia nonprofit uh, corporation, like so many other. Uh, uh, Trade associations. It's here to be an advocate for the industry it represents. Mm -hmm. When was the ICA founded, Phil? Well, it was founded in uh, 2006, and actually, it, uh, it it originated out of the last uh, debate on the uh, dot com registry agreement. Uh, I actually, uh, I in 2005, I was not aware of domainers, and uh, I knew about ICANN, but I didn't have the kind of uh, inside knowledge I have now. I had worked on a lot of other uh, uh, e-commerce issues, uh, digital copyright and digital cash and biometric authentication, things like that. And I was hired in 2005 by uh, Pool.com, which is a Canadian uh, secondary market firm, to lobby in parallel with CFIT, the uh, uh, Coalition for Internet Transparency. That was a uh, ad hoc coalition opposing the settlement of the litigation brought by VeriSign against ICANN over the dot-com agreement and whether uh, it should be put out for competitive rebid. And uh, there was huge outcry in the community when uh, ICANN announced the settlement, which gave uh, VeriSign presumptive renewal till the end of time and the ability to raise prices without justification. Uh, there was a big lobbying effort at the time. All the major registrars were involved. Uh, there was some bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. Uh, ultimately, we were not successful in blocking Department of Commerce approval of the uh, agreement, even though Department of Justice had ruled that uh, .com had market power in the domain name uh, space. But uh, actually, uh, the law firm I was with, uh, we were able to... Uh, at the time, we were able to get the only oversight hearing ever held in the U.S. Congress on that dot-com settlement. It was actually held in the House Small Business Committee uh, to, to assess the impact of the settlement on small business. And that's where I first met domainers who came up for the hearing. And they said, you know, 
people don't know we exist, or worse, if they know we exist, they think we're all cyber squatters. They're all bad actors, and we need to do something. And I said, well, you need to either form an ad hoc coalition or form a trade association mm -hmm. to start participating in Washington and in ICANN and show people that you're a legitimate business and uh, uh, help them understand what your business is mm -hmm. and, and how it is legitimate and have a... Uh, build up credibility to become an effective voice uh, in D.C. and in ICANN, and they said that's a great idea, and we talked a few months, and the association launched in September 2006, so we've, uh, a couple of months ago, we celebrated our sixth anniversary. Excellent. And who were some of those founding members that came to these hearings that participated in the early days in the formation? Well, uh, I, I forget... Uh, exactly who was at the hearing. I know that there was a company at the time, uh, Internet Reap, they're no longer with us. They were uh, active in the founding, but most of our other uh, founding members are still uh, with us, still good supporters. Uh, Cito and Jeremiah Johnston uh, of Cito is our president, uh, oversee Traffic Z among in individual domainers. Uh, uh, Frank Schilling was there at the beginning, Mike Birkins, the Ham Brothers, uh, Greg McNair is a great supporter, and and I can't list everyone who supports us in this uh, interview, but uh, our our founding members have pretty much stuck with us through the years. Our, our membership has grown, and uh, we're very grateful uh, for their support. So it sounds uh, which like it was. On, it, it sounds like it was a lot of people in the industry. It wasn't just you know two or three people that came together to form ICA. It was really a, 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 a culmination of all the major organizations in the uh, it in, in was the and, and while we formally launched in September 2006 uh, our membership really came together a month meeting I went down to a uh, traffic conference down in Miami and uh, where all these folks were attending and that's where it really got organized and people committed uh, the financial support uh, necessary to, to get it moving uh, forward how was the ICA initially viewed by the domain name industry or by ICANN? Do you remember? You know, it's it's hard to uh, evaluate. Uh, I have to say, unfortunately, a lot of domainers have a, I, I don't want to say cynical, but, but they're not convinced that participation in the uh, policy sector is an effective way to go. They, they, they just kind of say, what's the point? You know, they've got it wired. The big interests always win. And I think we've had enough uh, victories over the years and have had enough influence on policy to show that when you get organized and you, you marshal good arguments and you, and you, uh, you work uh, in tandem with other groups that have common interests. Uh, and I got to say, nobody gets anything done alone in the policy sphere. Uh, we have a saying in Washington, uh, success has a, set, has a thousand fathers, defeat is an orphan. Uh, but, but you look at any issue in the newspapers, uh, there's always groups on one side or the other. It's, it's hardly ever just one uh, interest. So uh, I think among domainers, I hope that a lot of the skepticism about whether the domain industry could be effective in the public policy uh, forum uh, has been dispelled over the last half dozen years by the results of what we've uh, done. Uh, I think ICANN uh, and Capitol Hill, uh, I think we've changed the perception of domain investors, where I think there was that perception that, oh, these guys are something sleazy, you know, cyber squatting, uh, whatever. And uh, there's a much better understanding now of the legitimacy of investing in great generic names at the top GTLDs and the top CCO, CCTLDs. And uh, when you look at the new TLD program, it's really, uh, you know, it, it's type in traffic at the top level. It's instead of having a great uh, registry name, you know, uh, registrant name registered at .com or .uk or something like that, it's having that name at the top level and hoping that draws consumer traffic. So uh, I think that alone legitimizes the business model. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so, you know, just like you dug into the financial statements on VeriSign in order to figure out how they're working and how profitable they are, 
and how they function and why they even need funding uh, to raise by raising uh, the uh, fees that they charge. I want to dig in a little bit on ICA because I couldn't find any financial statements. So I want to ask you, how is ICA funded in order to support the policy, the, yeah, the legal I, action? ICA the is funded by uh, uh, financial support for our members and our supporters. And also sometimes we get uh, uh, donations from folks who, who choose not to be officially uh, supporters or uh, Members, uh, our website's internetcommerce.org. Uh, we have, you can see everything I've been up to for years. We post all our comment letters. We post comments on issues that are pending in Washington and before I can. We're very transparent in our operations about what we're uh, up to. Uh, when we started out, I, I have to say, uh, we tried to build a much broader base of support to bring in a lot of the small domainers. Uh, we had two uh, sequential executive directors uh, who were tasked with trying to bring in people at a much lower membership dues level. For a couple of years, we had a bit starting membership due of $295 a year, less than a dollar a day. And uh, while we had uh, some members at that level, frankly, uh, it was a lot fewer than 100. Uh, it, it proved very... Uh, I think a lot of smaller domainers had the issue that, well, let Cito pay, let Frank Schilling pay. They've got the big interest here uh, and the big wallet. Uh, and frankly, it was not my decision. We have a board of directors uh, who decided that it was not cost effective to be paying an executive director as much money when there was so little take up on the recruitment. So they restructured the uh, membership structure about two years ago to be a member of the ICA, the starting dues are five thousand dollars per year. To be guaranteed a seat on the board, it's twenty-five thousand dollars per year, and that's where our, our biggest members uh, come in. Uh, uh, in addition to the folks who contribute at that level, uh, Nat Cohn of Telepathy, who's a great guy and a great contributor to our policy uh, views, he's been elected by the uh, members at the lower levels to represent them on the board and be their voice on the uh, board. Uh, you, you can be a supporter of the organization for as little as $1,000 a year, and we take donations in any amount, uh, mm -hmm. by credit card, PayPal, whatever. So that's the uh, structure right now. Makes sense. And so 5K so it's member. meant for people who have a significant, even $1,000 a year, we're very appreciative of that. Yeah. and. Uh, yeah someone's not going to contribute that unless they have a significant investment in the domain name space and what we do matters to them and there's quite a few people in that category definitely so 5k a member 25k for a seat on the board uh anybody including myself you know i i don't uh make investments uh in domain names for for flipping or so i don't have a large portfolio like other people but i find this to be an important topic and so i can make a donation of any amount to ICA, and I can just do that on a regular basis or a yearly basis or whatever I choose. Any way you want to. Okay. Any way you want that to. That makes sense. What's the total nope. income of ICA that uh, then goes directly to expenses since you're not a five uh, since you're a not for profit? Uh, it all goes. We run a very lean operation. Uh, I'll be frank. My uh, retainer and my expenses for attending ICANN meetings are the main. Uh, and, the, and paying an accountant uh, to do our books and uh, uh, our corporate filings every year. That's all the expenses mm -hmm. we have. Uh, I do an awful lot of work for the association uh, for, I think, a reasonable retainer, and the board thinks so uh, as well. Uh, if we could raise more money, uh, it wouldn't go to my pocket. It would go to other activities that would benefit domain investors. Frankly, we should have some presence in Brussels with the European community mm -hmm. uh, because they're a big player on these policy issues and we right now we don't have the funds uh, to afford that. Uh, we should, uh, if we had more money, we'd do more PR, uh, educating mm -hmm. uh, particularly people inside the Washington Beltway uh, about the domain investment uh, sector. If we had more funds, we could, when there's a key trademark case uh, or a key UDRP, we could file an amicus brief in federal court or we could you know, find an attorney to represent a domainer who doesn't have a lot of uh, money to fight a key uh, 
UDRP issue, but it's important to everybody. So those are the kinds of things we would do if we had more support. It's not that Phil Corwin would get more money right. uh, if we had a bigger budget. Definitely. But it sounds like most of the income goes to spending time to have you organize the issues for the group, uh, organize the letters, get the input from people, uh, members in the community, um, pull together their thoughts, file the motions, make sure that you're attending the events, that, that people are discussing yes. the right topics. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I do want to give a shout out to CETO uh, and to our president, Jeremiah Johnson, because uh, I am paid for my time. Jeremiah uh, spends a considerable amount of time uh, on uh, administrative duties related to being president for which he receives no compensation. He just uh, does that and CETO allows him to do that. And uh, we're very appreciative of uh, that in-kind contribution beyond their financial contribution. Definitely. And a lot of people, including Nat Cohen, who has been a proponent for ICA with Domain Sherpa to try and get some sort of uh, um, interview going and education to the community is uh, also, I know, a big supporter. Is Jeremiah Johnson president of ICA? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I couldn't find a board of directors listed on the ICA website. Maybe it was just because I didn't find it. Um, so are you able to... Um, Name the uh, people that are associated with uh, the board of directors of ICA. Uh, yeah, yeah. We uh, it's. Uh, I'm trying to think right now. It's uh, Jeremiah's on there as president. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Philip Reynolds from Traffic Z. Uh, 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 Josh Green from Oversee. Uh, he's their general uh, counsel, and Nat Cohn representing all the other. Uh, members. So that's the current uh, board membership. Great. And those are some of the, uh, I believe those are uh, the platinum sponsors. And then I also saw regular members listed on your website, telepathy, escrow.com, worldwide media, first place, PPX and reflex publishing. Does that sound right? Right. Right. And that's, uh, you know, Mike Birkins and mm -hmm. Frank Schilling and mm -hmm. uh, Greg mm -hmm. McNair and uh, people that are well known in the industry and contribute their money and, and their time to the ICA. Gotcha. What's the total income of ICA? It's very modest. It's less than $200,000 a year, which is nothing for a trade group. That's why uh, yeah. uh, you look at any any company with uh, trademark issues, any uh, Fortune 500 corporate, they spend more on one trademark council per year active in ICANN uh, and Interna uh, International Trademark Association, and we have to represent the entire industry. It's it's a David versus Goliath yeah. struggle, but we think we nonetheless have a significant impact. Definitely. On the ICA website, internetcommerce.org for the audience, there's a code of conduct. It says, quote, the ICA will guide members in conducting the domain name investment and development activities with professionalism, respect, and integrity. How does the ICA do that? Well, Fred, we don't... We I'm happy to say that our members are uh, very above board professionals who uh, 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 don't want the hassle of uh, UDRPs or uh, trademark litigation. They don't want to waste their money investing in suspect uh, domains. Uh, you can't afford. You can't avoid an occasional UDRP if you have a big portfolio. Somebody's going to come at you. Because uh, a lot of people out there don't understand trademark law, or they're engaged in reverse domain name hijacking. But uh, you know, our board adopted that uh, code of conduct. Let me give you an example. One of the provisions in that conduct is uh, that uh, domain investors shouldn't try to uh, exploit tragedies, disasters for commercial gain. And I just posted something. Uh, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, decrying the, really the disgusting and sometimes fraudulent efforts of some people to capitalize on the human misery of Hurricane Sandy mm -hmm. uh, with fake domain sites. Uh, some of them just trying to monetize traffic with PPC. Some of them engaged in clear frauds trying to pretend they were a legitimate charitable organization to uh, uh, try to divert money that should have gone to the Red Cross or other charitable organizations. So uh, we speak out, uh, but we've never had a situation of any of our members uh, uh, being uh, the subject of uh, uh, actions which uh, 
showed that they were engaged in improper practices and deliberate cyber squatting. Uh, and again, again, trademark law, there's gray areas. Uh, what we, what our code requires is not engaging in intentional cyber squatting or intentional mm -hmm. bad acts, and we've never had a problem with it. Great. Um, all right. It uh, sounds like it's uh, serving a great interest in the community. I think we've gone over a lot. Let me ask you this, uh, Phil. How is the yes. ICA preparing for the release of the new GTLDs, and what do you believe is going to be the biggest challenge for domain investors once they are released? Well, let me start with the second question first. I think the biggest challenge, and, and I'm not here to give advice for domain uh, investors, is whether they want to invest in particular new TLDs, and everyone's going to have to make their own uh, Judgment on that, I know some folks in the industry are of the opinion that uh, new GTLDs we've seen in the past have not been particularly successful for domain uh, investment. I, I think we're looking at a different animal here uh, where there's going to be a lot more specialized verticals where people may want to go in and perhaps, you know, the PPC not model to some extent is on the wane end anyway because of changes in search engine practices, changes in... Uh, what PPPs, PPC revenues are, but there may be great development opportunities in some of those new verticals for uh, people. Uh, it's no secret one of our well-known members, Frank Schilling, has uh, started a company, Uni Registry, which is one of the major applicants for new TLDs. So on the investment side, everyone's going to have to decide for themselves, uh, do they see uh, reasonable investment opportunities uh, in the new TLDs, and we're not here to give investment uh, advice. Right. What we are here to do is to make sure our particular focus with new uh, TLDs, and we do this within ICANN uh, in a couple of ways. We, uh, we're a member of ICANN's business constituency, which gives us uh, a lot of inside uh, information flow we wouldn't see uh, otherwise, and an ability to uh, talk to other major business interests and uh, see where there's common ground. We participate in working groups. We attend ICANN meetings and uh, I speak out at all the public forum at ICANN meetings. Uh, our real challenge again with the new TLDs is that unfortunately uh, some folks in the trademark community have looked at new TLDs uh, to as an opportunity to create a dirt cheap substitute for the UDRP with a deck stacked against registrants so that they almost always win and uh, to create new rights, uh, new trademark rights and domains that don't exist on the law books of any name. And it's not ICANN's job to be a legislature creating new trademark rights. Absolutely, their policies should enforce and protect the existing trademark rights, but they have no business creating uh, new rights. So we're engaged right up to this week in uh, watching particularly uh, Uniform Rapid Suspension, which is the new rights protection mechanism mm -hmm. for the new TLDs. And let me say, whether a domain registrant intends to invest in new TLDs or not, they cannot ignore URS. Uh, we're not in favor of URS coming to .com and the other incumbent uh, generic TLDs, but I'd be lying to you to say that it's not probable that they will be applicable to .com and the other GTLDs at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of ways that could happen. One, uh, ICANN's policymaking body, the GNSO, has uh, resolved to address UDRP reform starting 18 months after the first new TLDs are added to the uh, route. So we expect that uh, first new TLDs to uh, come online in the third or fourth quarter of 2013. So we're looking at that uh, UDRP reform process starting sometime in 2015. Uh, the GNSO resolution specifically says that they're going to look at the new rights protections, which is the trademark clearinghouse, which is a database of uh, globally protected trademarks, uh, and the URS uh, at the time that you had UDRP reform. So we know the trademark interests are going to advocate at that point in time that uh, URS be applied to .com and the other incumbents. Now, some of them tried to get that in the .com renewal contract. We resisted that. They didn't get it in there. There's another way it could come in. 
Uh, right now, uh, there's no more registry registrar separation for the new TLDs. The old TLDs, they're still prohibited right now from uh, being, uh, the registries are prohibited from being affiliated with a registrar, but they can apply to ICANN to end that separation. So if VeriSign wanted to affiliate with a registrar to have it become part of their corporation, they could make an application to ICANN. Uh, and there's two possibilities there. Either dot com would then, as a condition of ending that separation, become subject to all of the new registry contract uh, provisions, which includes URS, or VeriSign could apply and say we only want on some of them and that would be open to public comment but again we know that the trademark interest at that point in time would say we want URS on dot com so if you got dot com domains and dot net domains and you think URS is nothing to worry about because it's only for new TLDs wake up and smell the coffee we're going to be debating we've already debated its application to dot com that debate's going to come around again and again and that's why we have to make sure that the URS respects the legitimate rights of domain registrants, that it balances registrant rights against trademark rights, and uh, gives adequate due process. Uh, there's frankly been some suggestions from the trademark industry that would turn URS into a trademark version of SOPA, where it's completely stacked against uh, registrants where they don't have adequate uh, administrative rights. And as long as ICA is around, we're going to be fighting uh, very strongly and very loudly against any attempts to get that kind of unfair advantage. So is it fair to say that it's a battle between the trademark owners and the domain name owners around these domain names, which may include trademarks? Well, uh, you know, to be fair to uh, the trademark owners, and let me say I'm a member of the International Trademark Association. I went to their uh, big annual meeting that was held in Washington this year, they just have a different perspective. Uh, they look at fourteen, the potential for fourteen hundred new TLDs, and then they look at uh, defensive domain portfolios they already maintain, where ninety percent of the domains they own and have to pay for every year are domains they really don't want at all, will right. never use. They only c keep paying those registry fees to keep them out of the hands of bad actors, and there are bad actors out there, there are real cyber squatters, not in our association, hopefully, but they exist out there. And they look at 14 and say, what is this going to cost us? How many more UDRPs are we going to have to bring? How many more domains are we going to have to buy that we don't want just to keep them out of the hands of bad actors? So they just have a different economic interest, and we respect and understand that interest, but we can't let them trample registrant rights while they're protecting their own uh, their own interests. So, right. uh, and frankly, uh, when we get UDRP reform on the table, if we can get some uh, some of the protections we want for registrants, address some of the complaints that registrants have about way the UDRP operates now, uh, I don't see any reason why we can't uh, uh, put on the table discussing things like why do. People have to keep paying year after year for domains they will never use. Why can't they just lock them away somewhere, pay one one-time fee, and they're they're off the table for everybody right. from now till the end of the time? So I think we can find uh, bargaining chips in those discussions to hopefully get a balanced solution. Exactly. And as a trademark owner with small businesses, I feel the exact same way. I do not want you know, 1,900 new TLDs where I'm worried that somebody else is going to try and take advantage of the trademark that I've registered, that I've made, uh, uh, put in goodwill and, and uh, money into to develop, and somebody else is going to try and do it, and it's going to cost me money to file UDRP. So I completely understand. But what I don't understand, Phil, is I understand who it is that that is representing uh, that ICA is representing it's me as a as a domain name investor with generic domains right. Mike Birkins Frank Schilling it's anybody in the domain name industry but what I don't understand is the other side you know if you're looking at the trademark holders who is that organization who is funding that organization who is behind it well <laughs> it's 
It's the Fortune 500. It's the okay. big brand interests that have lots and lots of trademarks and are most susceptible to uh, cyber squatting. It's the International Trademark Association mm -hmm. as an umbrella group, frankly, and very unfortunately, it's also WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which uh, as a UN agency is supposed to take a balanced position, but frankly, the positions it's been taking on new TLDs, it sure looks like another trademark trade association. Mm -hmm. To me, uh, uh, WIPO actually took a position uh, that I'm happy to say, uh, let me back up. WIPO's position uh, on URS, WIPO said, uh, and it's wrong because we've now seen applications go in uh, that refute this, WIPO said that the, uh, the target price for administering a URS case of three to five hundred dollars per case. And remember, URS is supposed to only be for black and white, incontrovertible cyber squad. Which Basically, is what UDRP was name, supposed to be. And you say, yeah, yeah. That, that's infringing. I mean, right. it doesn't require, if it's any kind of shades of gray and not black and white, it's supposed to be in a UDRP, not in a URS. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't be very expensive. Uh, you're not talking about a long, drawn-out process here. But WIPO's position was that uh, the trademark interest weighted in, originally the URS model gave a registrant 21 days to uh, respond to a URS filing. The ICANN board last year, under pressure from trademark interest, caved in and reduced that to 14 days. Now, 14 days is not a lot of time for a domain registrant to say, what is this URS notice, what are the rules, and who should I hire? And, they, and then they have to, uh, you know, produce a response for me that's going to pass the laugh test. Two weeks is not a lot of time to uh, respond to something that can result in your domain being suspended and, and taking it off the grid. Uh, and WIPO took the position that where a registrant doesn't respond in those 14 days, that the trademark owner should automatically win every case, that there's no review of their complaint at all. It's just an automatic win. So that was their proposal for how to keep costs down. Let's have no justice at all for registrants. And I want to say I participated in a joint work. Over the past month, I was in a joint uh, working group uh, of the business constituency and the intellectual property constituency, which have been pushing for uh, tougher rights protections going beyond things really ICA can't support a considerable amount of what they're pushing for, but, you know, we, we have a voice, we get in the debate, and uh, even that working group concluded, no, we, we've got to have some substantive evaluation by somebody who understands trademark law. You can't just have an automatic win right. uh, in those cases. So here we had a business and intellectual property constituency working group, joint working group, that resent, uh, rejected the WIPO position. And I was in long debates on conference calls with members of the group, and we won that one, you know, on a very fundamental point of protecting domain registrant rights, and hopefully that's going to be preserved as ICANN goes forward with implementing uh, URS. But if ICA wasn't there, if I wasn't part of that working group, I'm not sure it would have gone that way. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a lot of that stuff is below the radar. It's too much detail for most domainers. Uh, that's why they hire folks like me. But uh, if you don't have a voice in the debate, nobody's going to consider your point of view. Yeah. Uh, and one more thing I want to uh, add, I'm chuckling a little. Nat Cohn, who's on our board, uh, he recently joined the business constituency. And... Uh, he sent me an email about a week ago after seeing some of the traffic on the business constituency uh, email list, which basically said, Phil, I had no idea of what you were up against <laughs> <laughs> in this group, but we're happy to have Nat and some other domainers in the business constituency to, to give a different point of view. And uh, I will say, even when we don't agree, uh, the people from the big corporations and uh, the trademark association uh, – they give us a fair hearing. They respect our views. They may not wind up agreeing with us, but we do. Uh, we have a very – nobody tries to shut down our voice within those IAN discussions. So uh, it is a fair debate uh, whether it comes out our way or not Yeah. in that we get our voice heard. And that's important. 
If uh, you have a follow-up question for Phil, please post it in the comments below, and we'll ask Phil to come back and answer as many as he can. Phil, I believe you're sure. on Twitter uh, with ICA, is that correct? Well, uh, ICA has their own uh, Twitter. They repost all my tweets, and uh, uh, I'm on Twitter at, at Virtual Law. So, okay, uh, at Virtual Law. B-I-R-T-U-A-L-A-W. Great, and I believe ICA, the Internet Commerce Association, is on Twitter at ICA Domains. Yes, it um, is. Thank and you for... And everything I post, uh, ICA reposts, so you can see everything uh, we're doing at the ICA uh, Twitter feed. Excellent. So, you know, most of the audience has spent 45 minutes with us here, Phil. I hope that they've uh, realized that you're providing value not just to the members that are paying uh, to be members or board of directors for the ICA, that you're actually representing every domain name investor out there, big and small alike. And I will urge them to, uh, to make a donation that they feel comfortable doing. And they can go to internetcommerce.org and look for, I believe it's a donation link. And they can make any size donation. You via can PayPal. donate. You can join. Uh, we, we'd love in-kind contributions of, of contributing time on, on issues that are concerned concern for you. That's a way to get more done. Uh, yeah, we thank you very much. We welcome any more support. And yes, we we speak for uh, whether you're a member or not. The positions we're taking uh, in Washington and in ICANN uh, are of benefit to you if uh, you have any significant investment in domain registrations. Yep. And I appreciate that. Phil Corwin, thank you for coming on the show, sharing the information about the Internet Commerce Association and, and what you are achieving for all domain investors. And thank you for being a domain Sherpa. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care.